that was uh, that's Grandpa's favourite hymn, and um, what an amazing thing that is! Uh, memories of uh, my grandpa. That brings every time I sing that song, that brings them back to me. And uh, he died when I was ten, so that's back in so about nineteen sixty-eight, I think. So it's a long time ago, but um, it's good to remember those in our past. I never saw any of my grandmas. They, they died long before I was born. But um, just thinking of, you know, our kids, they were able to spend time with my parents in their, up until their 20s. And Wendy's mum and dad are still going, so that's great. But yeah, you know, things things change, don't they? And sometimes, back in the back in the day, uh, we didn't live perhaps quite so long, or diseases caught up with us. But um, today, yes, we're going to talk about prayer, and um, this is a this is a really big subject. So, this is just some of my reflections on prayer, and I trust that they encourage you and encourage you to be a prayer to be somebody who prays. So um, we're just going to ask the Lord to encourage us today as we uh, look at his word. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I want to thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to honor you, to give praise to you. Thank you, Father, for the uh, opportunity to pray, to pray to you, our God and creator. And we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a, uh, a saying that I hear often, and it's, it's probably said mostly by, by Christian people, and it rubs me up the wrong way. I don't know, you know what that means, don't you? Rubs me up the wrong way. It kind of, uh, kind of just hits a bit of a snag on the way through. And, um, and the saying is this, that basically... Things are going to change because of the power of prayer. Prayer is all powerful and prayer is just going to change, just going to change it. Now, uh, maybe that's what you say and, you know, I'm sure I've said that too, but the thing that is powerful in this situation is not the words that we say, but God. And, you know, sometimes people on the telly in some disaster will say, our prayers are with you. What does that mean? Who are they praying to? You know, right throughout the Old Testament, people prayed to wood and stone and gold and silver and idols and all of these things and trusted them to save them and help them. The people of Israel... Of course, they prayed to God, the living God, the creator of the universe. And so that line, that throwaway line, rubs me up the wrong way. Our prayers are with you. Okay. I trust and pray that when you use that line, that people know that you pray to the living God, the creator of the universe. And so there, there are lots of examples of prayers in the Bible. And um, we're not going to look at many of them. But firstly, who do we pray to? There we go. Who do we pray to? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 27 of Genesis, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In Psalm 8, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. Psalm 19, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. This is the God we pray to. Psalm 139. 
You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Verse 13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. This is the God that we pray to. When we get down on our knees and talk to him, the God who knows you intimately, he knows everything that's going on in your head right now. He knows your life completely. And then in Colossians it says, the sun is the image of the invisible God. This is the Lord Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things. In him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Are you getting an image of who God is? The God that we pray to is the creator of the universe. The God that we pray to knows me right from the very beginning. He knows me personally. He knows everything about me. He knows everything that's going on in my mind and in my life, in my circumstances. He knows everything. There is nothing that he doesn't know about me. And then in Colossians, it tells me that he sustains everything keeps it going not only did he create it but without him it would all just go kaboom and us as well and then he made it possible for you and i to have a relationship with him by making peace through his blood shed on the cross that's the god that we worship and the god that we pray to sometimes we talk about who we should address when we pray. Who should we talk to? And that can be complicated for some. You know, should we be talking to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? Who should we be talking to? And I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I want to say something that John Piper said. And, um, and probably this is, is maybe true for you, some of this, for example, most of us in the evangelical family probably grew up beginning our prayers with Heavenly Father or Our Father or Dear Father and ending them with In Jesus' Name. And that's something that we learned. And uh, we pray to the Father and we close in Jesus' Name. Amen. And uh, John Piper says, well, I'm going to argue that that's a great tradition. And I think children should grow up with that form as the main form of their prayer. Pray to God the Father in the power of God the Spirit, uh, God the Spirit in the name or by the authority and the merit of God the Son. And that's the Trinitarian structure mainly of prayer in the Bible. And so it's not surprising that it's uh, firmly grounded in Scripture. And in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, it says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. We can only come to God 
in prayer, pleading for grace, because we have a high priest, which is why we pray in Jesus' name. John Piper says, I would never let my kids, at least I tried not to, use in Jesus' name, amen, as a throwaway phrase at the end of a prayer. I told them, don't slur that, don't rush that. These words express something glorious and essential. We have no access to God without Christ and his name. And so when we pray in Jesus' name, we are saying that to the Father. Now listen to this. I am coming not because, I am sorry, I am not coming in my own name. I'm not coming in my own merit. I'm not coming in my own worth. I am coming because Christ loved me. Christ died for me. Christ rose for me. Christ intercedes for me. That's what that little phrase carries. In Jesus' name. And that's just huge, isn't it? What, those, what that name, I come to the Father in the name of Jesus. Because that's the only way we, we can get there. That is the only way to God. It's the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As we pray, we address the Lord Jesus. As we pray, we address the Holy Spirit. And you know, the Bible uh, clearly reminds us that sometimes we grieve the Spirit. In Ephesians 4.30, and I think if I grieve the Spirit, I should say to the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry that I grieved you. So there's no issue with grieving, the, uh, sorry, with addressing the Spirit of God when you're praying. So let your normal, regular praying be prayer to the Father through the Spirit in the name of Jesus. But realize that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are persons. And to speak to them as a saved sinner cannot be unnatural. Yep. <laughs> Why do we pray? There are lots of things that we could say here. But the first thing that I want to say is one of the reasons that we pray is so that we grow as a Christian, as a believer in the Lord Jesus. And if we're going to grow in the Lord Jesus, we need to pray. We need to gain a deeper knowledge of God. We need to talk to him. We need to talk to him daily. Relationships grow when communication happens. You might think you know heaps of stuff about someone. But in reality, you have no relationship unless you talk to them. And you'll recall if you're a married person, perhaps at some stage you were courting and you just couldn't wait to talk to that other person because you wanted to know them. You wanted to talk to them. You wanted to find out what they were interested in, what they did, who they were, what they were thinking. And I can remember those, those times quite clearly, you know, driving to meet Wendy so that we could talk. We couldn't do that. It was on the phone so you could talk. Relationships build and grow when we communicate. Talking, doing things together. And telephones are amazing, aren't they? Without them, we couldn't maintain relationships like we do. And the same applies in our relationship with the Lord Jesus, our relationship with God, our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We need to communicate. A daily quiet time is a great place for this to happen. And I know I say it lots of times, but we have God's word. 
God is speaking to us and we need to speak to him. And as we do that, we're going to grow in our faith and in our walk with the Lord. And uh, it's, a, it's a marvelous way to, uh, to grow in the Lord. One of my lecturers at, at uh, Bible school back in 1981, he passed away last week. His name was Jack Boyens. You may have heard of him. And I've told you guys before, this is something that I remember from Jack. And he said to me, Alan, he said, if you have an ear for God in the morning, you'll have a voice for God during the day. And uh, that, that stuck with me. That stuck with me. So to grow in the Lord, we need to communicate with him. We need to spend time with him. We need to do those things that allow that relationship to grow. In Luke 18, 1 to 8, it uh, talks about the parable of the persistent widow. And the Lord Jesus said this. He told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The authorized <coughs> version of the Bible translates part of this text in this way. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus was teaching, of course, that we ought to be committed to prayer. But it is also true that when we fail to pray, then faint-heartedness soon follows. We either pray or become a prey, P-R-E-Y, to spiritual weakness and lethargy. You know, praying can be challenging. It's a challenge. You know, it's always easier to find something else to do. It's always easier to, to be thinking, oh, I should be doing that. I got to do that. You stay still for a moment to, to think about the Lord and your mind goes everywhere. It can be difficult, it takes discipline, and it's challenging. Nevertheless, it has to be said, nobody who has neglected prayer has grown spiritually. You want to grow in the Lord? Be a person who prays. And let's not neglect to pray. Like this, uh, this widow, she was persistent. We need to be before God with our prayers. In order to grow as a Christian, we need to share the day's activities with him, to uphold others before the throne of grace, to pray for the nation of Australia and its peoples. Praying is a conversation with God in which we talk to him as a friend. A French archbishop and theologian named Francois Fenelon, who lived in the 17th and early 18th century, wrote, Tell God all that's in your heart as one unloads one's heart, its pleasures and its pains to a dear friend. Tell him your troubles that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys that he may sober them. Tell him your dislikes that he may help you overcome them. Talk to him of your temptations that he may shield you from them. Show him the wounds of your heart that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to good, your depraved taste for evil. Tell him how vanity tempts you to be insincere, how pride disguises you to yourself and others. Tell him he's your friend. <coughs>
When do we pray? The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing, meaning continually. Continually. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That worked. We got that sorted, didn't we, John? And we just said, thank you, Lord. That was great. Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, not just some, not just the difficult ones when things are going pear-shaped, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So when you get up in the morning, thank the Lord that you're still compass matters. Give glory to him. Pray for protection. Pray for guidance. A prayer of thankfulness. A prayer of praise. All of these things are part of our, our prayer life as we communicate with the Lord. As we tell him our, our trials and difficulties and as we think about him and as we commit our day to him. Now, next one, how do we pray? And one of my favorite Bible characters is, um, is Daniel. Daniel was a great prayer. And we can learn lots of things from Daniel at prayer. And uh, in Daniel chapter 6, you'll remember that that's the story about Daniel in the lion's den. We all know that story. We've heard that story many times. And, um, and you'll remember that those politicians that in that day were trying to line Daniel up. They had the crosshairs on the back of his neck. They wanted him gone. He was too godly for them. He, he was too honest for them. He wasn't taking kickbacks and bribes and stocking his own bank account at, at the king's expense. He had the king's interests at heart. And, uh, and so, of course, you'll remember that they, behind Daniel's back, had a decree instituted that made it... Um, against the law to pray or ask anything of any God for 30 days. And then this uh, law was announced. In verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree during the next 30 days? Anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty would be thrown into the lion's den. What are we going to learn from Daniel? It's just a little short snippet. But we know from this couple of verses that Daniel prayed habitually. He prayed habitually. It was a habit. How are we going, boys? Could you click that for me? It just doesn't seem to... That's it. He prayed habitually. Just as he had always done. You know... It's important to form the habit of prayer before the crisis arrives. So it's no good kind of thinking, well, well, it is okay, but the crisis arrives and I get down on my knees. Sure. For Daniel, it was a habit. It was something that he always did. And it's, it's important to form the habit of prayer before the crisis arrives. And what prayer habits do you have in your family? Do you pray together? Do you pray at the start of the day? Do you pray at the end of the day? Do you pray at mealtimes? 
Why do we pray? To give honour, to give glory to the one who provides for all our daily needs. Think about that. Make it a habit. <clears throat> Make it a habit. Reverently. Daniel, it says here in this passage, Daniel knelt down. And man must acknowledge his need and come to God who is ready to meet that need. Do you pray on your knees? What's the point? Why pray on your knees? Ooh, that's different. On many occasions when I went into my mum and dad's room to I don't know, talk to him or something. Dad would be on his knees. Absolutely. What's the point? Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And and streaming on Christ the live book. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. On your knees is good. Openly, at the open window, Jesus taught us not to pray as the Pharisees in Matthew 6. But Daniel, the man who knows God, is not going to hide his relationship to God as some sort of guilty secret. He knows God. And he doesn't mind if everybody knows that. Are you embarrassed? Are you embarrassed to, pa- to bow your head at a cafe? Don't be. Bow your head. Honour God for what he's done for you. Next one. Frequently. Three times a day. He sometimes prayed long prayers, but more often, I'm sure he prayed short prayers regularly. As we've been talking, practice the presence of God. Talk to God. Tell him everything. Lord, I need wisdom. What do I do now? How do I sort this issue? How do I sort this relationship? And then lastly, thankfully, giving thanks. What cause of thanksgiving did Daniel have in these circumstances? He knows God so well that he can praise God on the brink of the lion's den. So what is our response? Can we make a difference? One of my uh, quiet times this week uh, in the word for the day, Winston Churchill often repeated the famous saying, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Take a look at society today. The conditions that preceded the fall of many great civilizations are in place. You ask, can our nation be saved? Yes, it can. You'll remember that God told Abraham if he could find as few as 10 righteous people in the city, he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah from judgment. That was a great prayer, wasn't it? That prayer of Abraham. When he he pleaded with God to save uh, his nephew Lot. What a prayer. God answered that prayer. He didn't save Sodom and Gomorrah, but Lot and his family were saved. And... Um, Yes, God told Abraham if he could find as few as 10 righteous people in the city, he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah from judgment. And a righteous minority can still save our nation. How? Through praying to our all-powerful God. 
In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now, you might say to me, well, that's not to me. That doesn't apply to me. Well, I think it applies to all of us. If my people who are called by my name... The future of our nation, it doesn't rest in the hands of bankers and politicians or TV personalities. It rests squarely in the hands of God's redeemed people. And that's you and me. Those people have put their faith and trust in God whose sins have been forgiven because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. That's us. Secondly, we'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God, you know, who needs nobody's authorization or approval to act, promises to move when his people turn to him and seek his face in prayer. Turn from their wicked ways. Instead of complaining about what's wrong with society, God commands his people to examine their own hearts to see what's wrong and make it right. And when they do, he promises to hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. You and I, you know, we're God's people. We proclaim to be the people of God. We can pray. We can uphold the situation of our nation before the Lord. It's not too late. Our nation can still be turned around if we pray and seek God with all our hearts. As we close, there are lots of prayers in the Bible that have been answered and are amazing. You'll recall them. You'll recall Daniel in the lion's den, how God shut the mouths of those lions so that they didn't harm them. What an amazing thing that is. You'll recall Hannah. You'll remember she prayed for a child and Eli thought she was drunk. But the Lord answered her prayer and gave her Samuel. You'll remember David. He and his man had been away and he gets back to Ziglag and all the women and children have been taken. He prays. And you know, God answered that prayer and gave them all their women and children back. None was lost, plus much more. And then we go into the New Testament and you'll recall Paul and Silas. They were in prison. They were singing. They were praying. They were just rejoicing in the Lord in their circumstances, which was shackled up and chained up. And there was a great earthquake and all their chains fell off. And you remember that man and his whole family got saved as a result of that. It was Peter. He was in prison and an angel poked him in the ribs and says, hey, wake up, Peter. We're out of here. Oh. So he got up and his chains fell off and the doors opened for them and they walked out. What an amazing answer to prayer. What about you? Has God answered your prayers? Do you have some things going around in your mind right now? Praise you, Lord, for that answer to prayer. Jim and Lynn's house has got a contract. Praise the Lord. Joe and Peggy are here today. That's great. You know, we've been praying for people, for illnesses and sicknesses, and God has answered our prayers. And, you know, in my own life, there are so many things that God has answered. And I should be writing them down. You know, there was, I've told you lots of times about the time on my motorbike when I lost that component and found it in the middle of the road. Probably don't need to remind you of that one. Randy reckons I've said that one too many times. But um, and many, many times he's saved me from certain death in different situations and he's provided he's provided a wife and family 
he provides our food. What an amazing God he is. He has answered our prayers. And so I'll just close now, just reading a, a, a prayer that um, I got online and, um, and an answer to, to that prayer. And this is just a book by S.B. Shaw and it's titled Touching Incidents and Remarkable Answers to Prayer. And it goes like this. Many years ago, James Rogers of the Alabama Conference of the Methodist Church told the story of Annie Clayton of San Jose, California. As a child, she and her sister Vanny took a long walk one Saturday morning to collect some scraps of wood as fuel for heating their family's home. And as they returned, Vanny collapsed from the lingering effects of cholera and was unable to proceed. Annie, who was only five years old, was helpless. And they sat beside the road, not knowing what to do. Finally, Vanny said, you know, Annie, a good while ago, mother told us that if we ever got into trouble, we should pray and God would help us. Now, you help me get down upon my knees and hold me up and we will pray. So there on the sidewalk, the two sisters prayed earnestly for someone to come along to help them. Then they resumed sitting on the curb, waiting to see how God would answer their prayers. Far down the street, they spotted a man who walked out of a factory and looked curiously up the street. And the girls thought, perhaps he was the one God would send. But the man went back into the factory. Presently, he came out again, looked up the street again and re-entered the factory. Then walked out of the factory a third time, wearing his hat and walking towards them. Approaching the children, the man said in a broken German accent, Oh, children, what is the matter? When they explained the situation to him, the German hoisted Vanny up on his brawny arms and carried her all the way home. Once the girls were safely delivered, the gentleman told his story. He was the proprietor of an ink factory, and he had been working hard on payroll checks for his men. Suddenly, as he was poring over his books, his eyes had clouded up and his vision had blurred. He had a plain impression that someone on the street wanted to see him. So he stepped outside, tried to focus his eyes up and down the street. Seeing no one, he returned to his desk and tried to work. The darkness in his vision was even worse and the impression was even greater. So he walked outside again, puzzled. Then he returned to his work again, but his fingers would not grasp the pen. He found himself unable to write a word. Moreover, the impression on his mind was urgent. So he fetched his hat and he walked up the street in bewilderment until he saw the girls who had prayed earnestly for someone to come along and help them. You and I need to keep praying. God answers your prayers and he may use you to answer another's prayer. So praise the Lord and keep praying. Thank you.